Hello, good morning to you and welcome to News Break Live from our studios at Laboni here in Accra, also available on DSTV channel 277. This is one of our platforms where you can bet to get the news first. And I am Ignatius Anon. Let me run by you the top stories we are following for you this morning. Government rubbishes claim that an IMF program would definitely include job cuts and bring untold hardship on Ghanaians. Chamber of bulk oil distribution companies to roll out credit rating system to determine the credit worthiness of all marketing companies. Lord shared an exercise to worsen as Nigeria reportedly stops gas supply to Ghana. Barack Obama affirms U.S. renewed and boasted effort to combat the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Heads of public schools urge to encourage people to adopt good hygienic practices to avoid contracting Ebola or cholera and other communicable diseases as they reopen this week. Also ahead, parents within La Wallace area whose children are caught defecating openly around the AU village will be prosecuted. We'll tell you why. Residents of Tuba near Kaswa in the central region demand early completion of roads and the construction in the area to reduce the stress commuters go through. The first batch of heart programs from Ghana arrived safely in Mecca while organizers work around the clock to meet flight schedules for those remaining. An also expected first batch of personnel from Ghana Air Force deployed to Mali for peacekeeping operations. Details right now. Stay with me. Hello again and thank you for joining me on Newsbreak Live on Metro Television. I am Ignatius Anom. Let's take a closer look at the news now in detail. And the Chamber of Bulk Oil Distribution Companies will soon roll out a credit rating system that will determine the credit worthiness of all marketing companies in Ghana. It forms part of measures to fast track debt recovery. This, according to sources, will help address decisions by banks to issue letters of credit, which often affect imports and subsequently result in fuel shortage. For clarity on this new direction, let's speak to Senyo Hosim, who is Chief Executive of bulk or distribution companies. Many thanks for joining me, Mr. Hossi. Uh, now, let me first ask you, exactly what will this exercise involve and will it work? I believe it should work. We need to professionalize and, um, you know, get our entire industry more functional. We have a mandate to mm. consumers and to the economy as a whole, and that should be our focus. We cannot allow our trade practices to actually impede our ability to execute our mandate. And that's the challenge we have today. You know, we generally have a liquidity crisis. Credit has consistently been abused by some oil marketing companies over the years, and inured to a lot of cost to our business and as well as the banking industry and the government as a whole. Mm. All these has to be kept. And for us to keep this, we need to start standardizing and trying to inject some order uh, or streamlining some of these uh, practices that we have like every standard professional body will. And that's what we, we hope to achieve. And it has to happen. If we don't get these things arrested now, its consequences will be much dire for the entire country. Uh, explain to me how you intend to work around this. How does it work, really? Explain to me about the details. Just like any credit, credit, credit uh, rating uh, system, it's all tied to your credit history. If you've, you have a track record of being a bad customer, there's no way you can keep enjoying credit. That has to be kept. If you have been a good customer, you should be encouraged to do what is right. The cost of CD funds at any given point in time is quite high. And that comes back to hit the P&L of any given BDC. Mm. And that also hits back in the viability of the industry as a whole. 
So you take a, a particular B, uh, oil marketing company, he's been performing previously very good, you rate him high. Just like, like any rating agency would do. Mm. You also go into his books and see if he has the capacity to still take on the level of credit that you give. To be owed over a billion dollars by oil marketing companies, it's, it's no joke. We are out there to improve the liquidity situation in this industry. We are out there to improve the viability of this industry. And we are out there to ensure that we can sustain our mandate to the consumers as far as this industry is concerned, and not give excuses like liquidity problems. We are testing government, we should also be standardizing and improving our own operations to enhance liquidity. Right. I, I'm sure you reckon that these all marketing companies um, have various banks that they deal with. Uh, exactly how will your rating affect their business in any way? I, I think that your credit behavior should cut across. You have a relationship with your bank. You don't behave right before your bank and behave wrong before your trade creditors. That's wrong. We should understand and know that this industry, in time past, used to run a close to cash and carry system. We moved on from that. Tor used to give two days credit with bank guarantees, 14 days credit with bank guarantees. And now we have a system where we give big OMCs 30 days credit with no bank guarantee, and that is abused. So why do we encourage that? We've been worsening the entire structure as time and competition has driven this industry. It is not sustainable, it does not inure to the benefit of the economy, and it doesn't inure to the benefit as of, the, of the consumer, who should be our primary focus. All right, but, but again, the reality uh, really is about unpaid uh, subsidies and not necessarily what motorists pay at the pumps. I disagree with you that the, 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 the issue is, just has to do with unpaid subsidies. It is a key part of it. Liquidity, the cash coming from government, the cash coming from the customer who is owing us is the same CD or the same dollar. Mm. So you just need to chase every money that you are owed as of now. We are engaging government to get paid. We need to also engage OMC to also get paid. You don't just treat one with one with, with, glo with uh, case gloves and treat another one with, uh, with a very serious hand. It's not fair. We are going out there to do what is right and what ennios ultimately to the interest of the consumer, to you and the economy as a whole. You are not in this business to champion the cause of any particular political party or any particular customer. We are here to champion the cause of the consumer who catch us in business. You who pay at the pump. You are my primary focus and you are out there to serve. I appreciate your time. We'll keep track on that particular initiative that you are mooting. Many thanks to you. And Senor Hossim is Chief Executive Officer of the Bulk Oil Distribution Companies. Let's do some more stories now. Government is rubbishing claims that an international monetary fund program would definitely include job cuts and bring untold hardship on Ghanaians. It, um, its reaction follows a press conference by the minority in parliament and statements by the Choice Union Congress CUC suggesting Ghanaians may not benefit after all. We'll hear from immediate past Deputy Finance Minister Pueku Ricketts Higgins' response. But before that, let's take a listen to uh, Dr. Anthony Kutose, who is a minority spokesperson on finance. Impending IMF negotiations may have influenced government's decision. But in any case, at an yield of 8.125, it is certainly very expensive. When compared to, for example, the one issued by La Côte d'Ivoire, which has a yield of 5.37. So government of Ghana, neighbor survival goals, they go in, they get 5.37. And we are so credible that we get 8.125. <laughs> and we are happy with it. Even Rwanda, Rwanda got something like 6%. And the government believes that it was oversubscribed because of confidence in the economy. Every goals after war is getting 5.37. Ghana, no war, peace and stability, 8.125. It is here, it's important to mention that Coco Bond also secured $1.7 billion. But the approved amount was not $1.7. It was $2 billion approved by Parliament. So the question you want to ask is that, don't forget that the Bank of Ghana said that Coco Bond will bring in $2 billion. Government will bring in $1.5, so they were expecting $3.5. Now, upon what has happened, it is $2.7. So there's a short sum of $800 million question is, how is government going to fill the gap? That I never want to know. We think that perhaps it is the first signal of how much the government is going to request from the IMF. But we don't want to prejudice negotiations because they are just starting. On our part, for the we want to...
Because government negotiate an IFM program that will not inflict further hardships on Ghanaians who have already suffered enough from the incompetence and mismanagement of this NDC government over the past six long years. Whatever agreement is reached with IMF should protect jobs, reduce the high cost of living, reduce the cost of business, and support the transformation of Ghana's economy. Hear the argument by the MPP at a press conference yesterday, but the government says that actually no cause for alarm. Kweku Wicket Hagan is former Deputy Finance Minister, now currently the Deputy Minister for Trade and Industry. I spoke to him yesterday in the following interview. We have decided, you know, as a government that we are going to go on a funded program. You know, um, we started, you know, implementing our own homegrown program, which I'm sure the finance minister has uh, talked about many times. Now, we got to a point where um, we wanted to do this, you know, by ourselves. We got to a point where certain things moved against, against us. Um, external shocks, for instance, um, cocoa and uh, gold prices falling significantly, meaning that we, we, uh, we lost quite a lot of revenue. Mm -hmm. When you are implementing these, these programs or these measures, you need some money to cushion you. Of, of course, um, uh, we, we were trying to do this on our own, but because those things move against us, together with the one and a half years of uh, power disruptions that, uh, that, that we had, so, but we had already engaged the IMF because we have given our homegrown policies to the IMF already. Okay. We've just started a discussion with the IMF. You cannot just preempt, you know, the discussions and, 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 you know, come up with something which has not, you know, been discussed or not put on the table. In our homegrown policies, which we have submitted. So, to the are, are you then saying that, um, as far as the IMF discussion uh, has been concerned, uh, you haven't had any issue about, you know, cutting uh, people from the public sector? Has that not been on the table no, at the, any point in time? The, the discussion actually, the the, as the discussion started today. It started today. Mm. But I, 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 I'm, what I'm telling you is that since we presented a, um, the homegrown policies to the IMF during the spring break. We've been talking to the IMF. We've been having discussions as to how, because the reason why we submitted this to them is for them to be able to help us. Don't forget that the IMF deals with a number of countries. Mm -hmm. And some of the problems we are facing today, the IMF has seen it elsewhere. So we went to them to be able to benefit from that, that experience. Yes, there is an issue with the wage bill. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we, we, need, we need to cut down the workforce. I mean, the issue with the wage bill is that spending, you know, now it's come down quite considerably above, you know, we started at, at around 70% of uh, tax revenue, mm. you know, being used to pay. Now I think it's come to around 57. Where we want to be is to be around 30, 35. This is part of our own home grown, you know, program. And the IMF, you know, agrees to that. Now, as to how we do it, what other ways are available to catch to catch the huge wage bill? First of aside all, the fact that IMF will say that listen, if you want me to be on board this, you need to do this and that, including getting people off. Absolutely, the starting point, as we all know, we've always been talking about ghost names, ghost names, ghost names. Some of the things we are doing, uh, embarking on biometric and other things, is to really look at whether the six hundred thousand we are talking about is actually six hundred thousand. Mm. You know, that process is still ongoing. You know. Quite recently, as we introduced the electronic payment system, we've been able to find out that there are 202,500 people, which will eventually will save about 400 million if it's, if it's done nationwide, are actually not there. So basically, we are paying money or we are paying salaries to people who, who, did, did, not, not who did not exist. Mm. If we continue this, 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 we will be able to weave out quite a number before we talk about other other ways of doing it we are just preempting a discussion and, and, which and, has and, not and, taken place and you think that there's no basis for the pre i mean the prediction is that what you well, think well what i'm saying to you right now is that in our own policies and the imf agrees to this where we want to be is to spend 30 35% of tax revenue to pay wages we are not there yet we are at 57 so the measures that we need to take together does not necessarily mean cutting 
catching, you know. Okay, the, okay. The, the, uh, uh, let's move to another critical issue that yeah. the minority raised today. Um, in your submission, you talked about the fact that uh, one of the problems we had was the energy crisis. Absolutely. Reasons we had the Millennium Challenge accounts coming in to support that sector. Mm -hmm. The minority think that we might not tap into that fund because of the IMF bailout. <laughs> that is, that is, uh, you know, that are absolutely wrong. You know, I mean, we are talking ab about the IMF as if we've never dealt with the IMF before. You know, we've been a member of the IMF since 1957. We've done various IMF programs since 1983, 83 to 89. We were in structural adjustment program, you know, economic recovery program. The last program we did was when um, um, late Professor Mills was the president, 2009 to 2012. It was during that period that we went for the CDB loan of three billion. Yeah, we, uh, so I don't actually see where this argument of uh, what in the Millennium Challenge, you know, um, program that really prevents us from going to the IMF. Yes, they had put some conditions down about us restructuring ECG and basically our whole, uh, you know, um, power and the energy structure. These are things we must do as a country. All right, Kweku Rikit Hagan, former Deputy Minister for Finance, now Min uh, Deputy Minister for Trade and Industry, uh, speaking to me there yesterday on the back of the minorities, um, you know, concerns about government negotiation talks with the International Monetary Fund. That's the aim of what, more of that uh, interaction for you on News at 1 earlier. Uh, there's actually, let's still stay on the energy sector and the ongoing low shedding exercise is likely to worsen. This follows Nigeria's decision to stop gas supply to the Republic of Ghana, but officials of the Energy Ministry say the crisis may not last as plants in place will soon be rolled out to generate more power. The ongoing load shedding exercise is likely to intensify following the decision by the Nigerian authorities to stop gas supplies to Ghana. This means more difficulties for industries struggling to break even as a result of the high cost of production from the use of generation plants. Reports say the latest decision which took effect from yesterday is in connection with labor unrest in Nigeria. What the stoppage of gas flow to Ghana means is that the Asogli power plant will shut down because it runs only on gas, it said. The Asogli power plant was augmenting Ghana's energy needs with an average of 180 megawatts. Graphic Online reports that a highly placed source at the Ministry of Energy said, quote, the Nigerian authorities communicated this bad news in the afternoon and the ministry has since been working out emergency measures to forestall adverse effects on individuals and industries." Unquote. Ghana's local and foreign businesses have been grappling with problems associated with the intermittent supply of electricity since 2012. Meanwhile, water level in their consumer dam keeps dropping while power plants in their country continuously operate below capacity. But there is a window of hope. Thermal plants in the country are also expected to be powered by the gas which will flow from the Etuabo gas plant. Additionally, two power barges expected to generate a total of 450 megawatts are being built in Turkey and are expected to be shipped to Ghana before the end of the second quarter of 2015. The first power barge, which has a capacity of 225 megawatts, has already been constructed. Work is also on schedule to tie the Etuabo gas plant to the floating production storage and offloading vessel, which is being operated by Talo Oil PLC. There was an eight-month break in gas supply from Nigeria to Ghana after a vessel broke one of the gas pipelines in Togo in August 2012. Ghana's demand for electricity is between 1,800 and 2,000 megawatts, but it is targeting 5,000 megawatts by 2016. And Metro News will keep a close eye on the story, keep you updated right here on Newsbreak. Newsbreak takes a short break and I'll be right back. Stay with me. Hello again, you welcome back to News Break Live on Metro Television and this is the platform where you can bet to get the news first with me, Ignatius. And let's do more stories now. And US President Barack Obama has outlined renewed and bo uh, boasted efforts to combat the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. He made these known at a press conference last night. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Please be seated. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Frieden and everybody here at the Center for Disease Control for welcoming me here today. Uh, Tom and his team just gave me an update on the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Our efforts to help mobilize the international community to fight it and the steps that we're taking uh, to keep uh, people here at home safe. Tom and his team are doing outstanding work between the specialists they have on the ground in West Africa and here at headquarters. Uh, they've got hundreds of professionals who are working tirelessly on this issue. This is the largest international response in the history of the CDC. After this, I'll be meeting with some of these men and women, including some who recently returned from the front lines of the outbreak, and they represent public service at its very best. And so uh, I just want them to know how much the American people appreciate them. Uh, many of them are serving far away from home, uh, away from their families. They are doing heroic work and serving in some unbelievably challenging conditions. Uh, working through exhaustion day and night, uh, and many have volunteered to go back. So we are very, very proud of them. Um, you know, their work and our efforts across the government is an example of uh, what happens when uh, America uh, leads in confronting some major global challenges. Faced with this outbreak, the world is looking to us, the United States, and it's a responsibility that we embrace. Uh, we're prepared to take leadership on this, to provide the kinds of capabilities that only America has, and to mobilize the world in ways that only America can do. Uh, that's what we're doing as we speak. First and foremost, I want the American people to know that our experts here at the CDC and across our government agree that the chances of an Ebola outbreak here in the United States are extremely low. We've been taking the necessary precautions, including working with countries in West Africa to increase screening at airports so that someone with the virus doesn't get on a plane for the United States. In the unlikely event that someone with Ebola does reach our shores, we've taken new measures so that we're prepared here at home. We're working to help flight crews identify people who are sick, and more labs across our country now have the capacity to quickly test for the virus. We're working with hospitals. Uh, to make sure that they are prepared and to ensure that our doctors, our nurses, and our medical staff are trained, are ready, and are able to deal with uh, a possible case safely. Uh, and here I've got to commend uh, everybody at Emory University Hospital. I just had the opportunity to meet with doctors uh, Gartland and Ribner and members of their team and the nurses who, uh, sorry doctors, but haven't been in hospitals, I know <laughs> they're the ones really doing the work. Um, and I had a chance to thank them for uh, their extraordinary efforts in helping uh, to provide care for uh, the first Americans who recently contra uh, contracted the disease in Africa, the first uh, generally. Now, this is a daunting task, uh, but here's what gives us hope. The world knows how to fight this disease. It's not a mystery. We know the science. We know how to prevent it from spreading. We know how to care for those who contract it. We know that if we take the proper steps, we can save lives. But we have to act fast. We can't dawdle on this one. We have to move uh, with force and make sure that uh, we are catching this as best we can, given that it has already broken out uh, in ways that uh, we had not seen before. So today I'm announcing a major increase in our response. At the request of the Liberian government, we're going to establish a military command center in Liberia to support civilian efforts across the region, similar to our response after the Haiti earthquake. It's going to be commanded by Major General Darrell Williams, a commander of our armed uh, army forces in Africa. He just arrived today and is now on the ground in Liberia. And our forces are going to bring their expertise in command and control, in logistics, in engineering. And our Department of Defense is better at that. Our armed services is better in, than, uh, at that than any organization on Earth. We're going to create an air bridge to get health workers and medical supplies into West Africa faster. We're going to establish a staging area in Senegal to help distribute personnel and aid on the ground more quickly. 
Uh, we are going to create a new training site to train thousands of health workers so they can effectively and safely care for more patients. Personnel from the U.S. Public Health Service will deploy to the new field hospitals that we're setting up in Liberia. And USAID will join with international partners and local communities in a community care campaign to distribute supplies and information kits to hundreds of thousands of families so they can better protect themselves. We're also going to build additional treatment units, including new isolation spaces and more than 1,000 beds. And in all our efforts, the safety of our personnel will remain a top priority. Meanwhile, our scientists continue their urgent research in the hope of finding new treatments and perhaps vaccines. And today I'm calling on Congress to approve the funding that we've requested so that we can carry on with all these critical efforts. Right, so that's the U.S. President Barack Obama there on effort by the U.S. government to combat the deadly Ebola viral disease, which is ravaging thousands of lives across the West African subregion. That's it for the entire team here on Newsbreak this morning, which came to you live from our studios at Laboni here in Accra, also available on DSTV channel 277. I am Ignatius Anom. We'll join you again in the next 30 minutes for more news live on TV. Good morning.